a test drive on Mars. I'm Tanya Hall, and joining me is Robert Hogg, Deputy Mission Manager for NASA's Mars 2020 Project. Welcome, Robert. Thank you very much. Good to be here. Congratulations to you and the team for such a great mission so far. Um, we spoke to your colleague, Matt Wallace, recently, uh, and he called Perseverance a well-behaved spacecraft. How would you characterize the mission so far? Uh, the, the mission has been going uh, like, like dream come true. Our, we engineers think and hope that this is the way it'll all play out after working for you know five, six, seven, eight years on a robotic system, sending it hundreds of millions of miles away to the surface of another planet, landing it through the seven minutes of terror, which I can describe to you, and then discovering that, that all the hardware is working, the motors are turning, the, the incredibly complex and, and, and extremely vital science instruments are, are working correctly. It's talking to us via the, the uh, orbiters that we have going around the planet. It's, it's been amazing, spectacular. So yes, tell us about the seven minutes of terror. What was it like? Uh, so it, it, it's called the seven minutes of terror because we, we go from tens of thousands of miles per hour coming into the Martian atmosphere. And, and in a period of seven minutes, we need to go to zero miles per hour, which is uh, mind boggling if, if you think about that and if you're uh, trying to design that. I'm not on the entry, descent and landing team. I'm on the uh, surface team, but I can tell you that the, the system that the engineers in the EDL team ha have designed over the years, we use the same system for Curiosity um, in 2012. It's it's a little Rube Goldberg, um, and, but, but there's really good technical reasons why we ended up, up doing, doing it this way. So long story short, we come into the atmosphere and the, the spacecraft is, is all capsuled up with the heat shield on the front and the back shell on the back. And the heat shield slows us down from tens of thousands of miles per hour to say uh, hundreds of miles per hour. And then um, the, the heat shield comes off and the back shell comes off and a giant uh, parachute comes out, the biggest one that we've ever used. Um, and it slows us down to, uh, don't quote me on this, but uh, I think we're still hundreds of miles per hour, maybe 50, something like that. And then we come down on retro rockets. And the, the retro rockets, um, usually you just land on the surface of, of another planet, like with the Vikings in the 70s, and, and your lander would have legs or like, you know, the moon landing with the astronauts and you just land with your retro rockets. But um, if, if you think about the amount of force needed to counteract all this inertia from a one ton rover, that's a lot of force that those rockets are, are, are blasting out, right? And so those hit the ground and rocks and dust are, are, are spewing up and, and flying all over. And we don't want all, all that debris hammering on the rover and its, its sensitive uh, instruments and, and other equipment that we have on there. So <laughs> they have designed something called the sky crane where it's, it's the rover is lowered from the descent stage, which is still uh, using rockets to, to hover on three nylon cords and one data cord. And it's, it's lowered the last uh, 10, 20 meters to the ground and then those cords are severed with power devices and the, the uh, descent stage is commanded to fly away as far as possible and just do a crash landing as far from the rover as we can get it. And all that takes place in seven minutes autonomously with no humans in the loop. So we're just sitting there watching the data come back uh, you know, through the one-way light time from Mars, which is about 11 and a half minutes. So the, our, our, our rover, which we have spent years uh, designing, building, testing, and launching, um, has either successfully landed or, or you know, created another crater on Mars before the, the, the signal even gets to us. It's already happened. And so we're, 
we're sitting there looking at all the telemetry and the indications of all these different stages. And uh, so now, now you get the terror part. All right. Okay. So let's skip to the surface then. Tell us about the short test drive that Perseverance just took and what are some of the coming tasks for the rover? Sure. Yeah. So the, the, we, we did our first drive of uh, all time uh, recently, and uh, this is a, a big milestone for us because um, again, all this hardware needs to make it safely to the surface of Mars and, and the ability to drive and rove and, and have mobility on the surface of, of on the surface mission is so vital because we need to take those science instruments uh, all over the place and and follow the science and find the, the best um, uh, uh, pieces of soil or rock or samples to prepare to bring back to Earth. So, um, and within the first, let's see, it was Sol, Sol is a Martian day. On Sol uh, 12, I believe, we did our first steer wheel wiggle. And uh, the team, uh, got the pictures down and, and, and saw the encoders uh, moving and saw that the wheels were, were working. And then the next day we did our first drive, six wheel drive. And essentially we drove a few meters forward, turned about, I wanna say 100, uh, maybe 180 degrees counterclockwise. And then we backed up and we imaged the ground that we had just driven over. Um, now I, um, I was doing a press conference the next day uh, discussing about discussing all this stuff and I s jumped onto my computer at 11:30 at night cuz I knew that the orbiter pass was coming down from from one of our relay orbiters and the 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 team was just starting their shift to analyze what happened in that drive and I jumped on there and looked at some of the telemetry and opened up our our, our image viewer and up popped a picture <laughs> looking out the front of the rover of our tracks. And um, I, I think you have a copy of it. I, I'll send it to you if not. And just imagine the tracks start from nothing as if something just fell out of the sky, landed, and then just started driving across the surface. And you can see its own tracks and the, the turn in place that it did. And it was just amazing because what was going through my mind in, in the days leading up to that, which I, you know, it's hard not to think about is if there's an issue with a couple of those actuators or a problem, we're not a rover, we're a lander. We are stuck in one spot and we will, you know, we'll be doing science in the area around us and doing some stuff with the arm, et cetera, but we we're not able to cover hundreds of meters and kilometers and kilometers to carry out our mission. If the first drive is successful, we are a rover, we are doing miles and miles on Mars, going to all these amazing scientific sites. And so that was, you know, the flip of the coin that, that was going on in my head as I was pulling up that image. Now, I, I was very confident that it was going to be successful and everything had been going, you know, perfectly up to that point. But still, these first time activities that we do have, have that compelling aspect to them when you're uh, seeing them in action for the first time. That is exciting. So, and I know that we're really still very early in the data gathering for the mission. So are there any offers that, any surprises rather that, that Mar Mars has offered up uh, as, as of yet? Uh, let's see, surprises. Um, you know, I don't have any big ones to point out to you. We, we are, I'll call it a nice surprise or a surprise that we we're hoping for is um, with this project, we were able to do much more precise landing than we have with previous missions into an area that uh, we would usually avoid uh, as far as where, where to touch down. And, and so we have, to make a long story short, uh, but actually your, your audience will appreciate this, we have a, a dedicated um, processor, a dedicated hardware, uh, FPGAs, field pro programmable gate arrays, that uh, we're doing vision processing, and I think it's about one time, once a second, uh, something like that, with a downward looking camera and comparing the results, uh, uh, comparing the, the images that we're taking in real time with onboard imagery that we have of the landing site. 
and thereby knowing where the spacecraft was and then able to do a, a divert maneuver to land in, in, a, in a safe spot. And so we had computer vision operating, helping us land in, in a safe location and, and a, and a pre-developed map that had all the safe locations that it could pick from. So that means we came down in a spot that we wouldn't have been able to land uh, you know, in previous missions. And so it's been interesting looking at the, uh, the surface imagery in this more dangerous environment. There's all kinds of interesting rocks and um, some bluffs and hills nearby and big boulder sized rocks off in the distance, you know, and it's so uh, I'll call that a really nice surprise being able to see all that stuff up close and personal from from the rover eye cameras after we came down. How do you test and qualify a rover designed for the extremities of another planet in the relatively mild conditions found on Earth? That is a fantastic question, Tanya. So uh, you, you, you take all the smaller pieces, uh, all the widgets, you know, the, the motor, and you test the motor at uh, minus 120 Celsius and, the, you know, the temperature swings that it's going to go through. We call it thermal cycling. Uh, hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold, to make sure that it's going to survive the day and night uh, temperatures on Mars. And then you test it. You do uh, vibration testing with it and shock testing, um, simulating what, what it's going to go through during launch and landing, and also just in, in operating the rover, driving over rocks and things. And then you take that motor and you put it together into a complete actuator and do the same thing. And then you take the actuator and build the whole robotic arm and put all that together. And you put all these big pieces together into a complete rover, and then uh, we take that up to our 25 foot uh, space simulator chamber uh, up the hill over at JPL. It's this huge chamber that I, I believe not a lot of uh, institutions have where we can simulate the Martian temperatures and uh, pressure. And we put the whole system in there and we, we uh, unstow the remote sensing mass and unstow the arm and move the wheels and uh, test dropping the helicopter. And so you, you, you build, you, you design it uh, in such a way that it's going to survive all these harsh environments, radiation hardened processor, um, lubricant in the, in the motors that, that isn't going to freeze up at the cold temperatures. Um, all these design decisions that you have to do for a one-off flight qualified space system that, that has to work the first time. And then you test it in all these different um, aspects of that, that Mars is going to throw at you. And you put it all together and test the whole thing as a system. And, you know, with the team that's going to be running it, taking images and doing that first drive and, and everything exactly the same. And then you send it to Mars and see what happens. You alluded to this a few times already. What's it like to work on a project that takes years to develop and months to travel before getting to see the results of your work, uh, that's a that, that's a that's a tough one. It's it's uh, incredibly uh, exciting, terrifying. Um, you know, I, I like I like to say that I could I could spend the seven years that I did working on this project and then and then. Uh, uh, walk away before it even launches or gets to Mars, and I still would be just entirely fulfilled on what I'd achieved, and and learned and experienced, and you know, grown as as a as a as a technical engineer and and everything. But man, the 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 payoff on seeing this actually go somewhere and do something that that frankly, uh, you know, humanity has not done before um, is, is, is really something to experience. And, and then of course you have the thoughts where, you know, depending on how the seven minutes goes tomorrow, I will have either have a job for the next two years or I'm gonna have to go find something else to do, you know, after we spend some time figuring out what happened. That's, that's a, a pretty stiff stuff, but, but overall it, it's just spectacular. It's, you know, it, it's a dream come true for 
an engineer or a scientist and, and the folks who like working on this stuff because you know you, you don't get to do something like this and carry it all the way through um this is the fifth rover of all time that that has been landed on mars successfully um and, and carried out a mission and i'm fortunate to be at jpl it's it's the only place that's that's done that and I think everybody else is going to be catching up shortly here, which I am all for. Um, it's going to be great having uh, as many rovers and explorers uh, heading over there as possible and heading to the other parts of our solar system. So back to your question, it's just fantastic. And, and uh, after all that hard work and, you know, going blind, staring at spreadsheets for three hours, uh, it, it's all worth it. And that's what keeps us going over here. Robert Hogg, Deputy Mission Manager for NASA's Mars 2020 Project. You're following the dream for all of us, Robert. If somebody wants to find out more about a lot of the discoveries that you're making, or maybe they want to follow you personally, what's the best way they can do that? Sure. Well, uh, they can uh, just type in uh, to a search engine, uh, Mars 2020, uh, or Perseverance, and they'll find our website with all the raw imagery that's being dumped uh, every day and, and uh, all, the, all the information there is fantastic. And then if they wanna find me personally, uh, they can jump on uh, Instagram and just go to uh, robert.hogg, H-O-G-G. -G, my, my first and last name with a dot in between there. Sounds good. Thanks for your time, Robert. Thank you very much. Absolutely. And find more of my interviews right here or at YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and tanyahall.net. Thanks for watching.